good to see you all. Um, even as I often say, even though the lights are dim, y'all look beautiful. Even you guys are looking beautiful. So it's good to be together. It's good to share. Um, our musicians are wonderful, are they not? They help usher us into the presence of God, and so I'm very thankful for that. And it was especially gratifying to uh, see our preacher from last Sunday, Poindexter Lowe, <laughs> by the drops. Dexy. Dexy. Um, today, uh, what I want to do is continue with you on a journey that actually we began some time ago. And that is working our way through a part of the New Testament that is known as the Acts of the Apostles. So we've kind of started in it, we took a little break, we, uh, had a series where we were talking about responding to Jesus, uh, but we're kind of picking this up again, talking about some of the things that were happening in the early church. Now, at this fellowship of faith, what we're trying to do is to help one another grow and deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ and to grow and develop our relationship with one another people. So we're all trying to get there together. One of the important aspects of the New Testament and even the Acts of the Apostles is that God is forming a community of faith. God is not forming just a bunch of individual people, kind of free agents to come and go, but God creates community amongst those who believe. And so as this community is forming, there are different challenges that they face. So part of what I want to pull out today are some of the challenges, because you might have heard Eric, read that passage and think, well, now, I don't really like that passage. <laughs> Why are we reading that today? Why are we paying attention to that today? Why is that in the Bible? It seems like Peter comes down pretty hard on Simon. I don't get it. And I don't like it. And so part of what I want us to grasp, or begin to grasp, is that everything that is in that beautiful book is there for a reason. So what's the reason for this story that we heard Eric share with us today? As I kind of unpack it in my mind, I'm thinking about a guy named Ron Burgundy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've seen the movie Anchorman, or maybe even Anchorman 2, I gotta tell you, I actually wanted to show you a clip, but we're all trying to figure out what you know we can do without getting thrown in prison here. You know, there's some things you can show and not we're trying to figure it out. So uh, so that you don't see Paul and Diane and myself breaking blocks at Leavenworth prison. <laughs> I'm going to have to describe it to you. If you've seen the movie Anchorman, uh, it's set uh, in San Diego in the 70s. It's this news team, and they are probably like on top of the ratings. They're, they're really amazing, and, and they've got competitors in the news market, but they are anchored by Ron Burgundy. And Ron is pretty full of himself. In fact, I would venture to say that Ron does not come across as a very deep person. But he's got all his newsmates, who happen to be all male, by the way, kind of in his corner, in his fold. They kind of look at him like he's the man. So the weather person, the sports person, uh, and some other person, I don't really know what he was doing, I don't really remember, are all guys, and they're all in love with Ron. Ron thinks he's something. So one day the general manager uh, comes in because it's the 70s and things are changing, right? And so amongst their bell-bottom pants and leisure jackets and uh, shirts, I was going to say shirts open collar, and I feel like I'm not wearing an open collar. <laughs> um, shirts open collar, trying to be mod and all that stuff. Uh, the general manager comes in one day and he says, we're going to make a change. You're going to have a co-anchor, Ron. And he introduces the lovely and talented Veronica Corningstone. Ron is upset. His cronies are upset. Because he doesn't want to share the platform with anyone. Because he's the man. And so when the general manager comes and says this change is happening and introduces Veronica and in she comes, I think Ron has a bit of mixed feelings because he doesn't want to give up his space. And yet, here is this woman that he, as the movie unfolds, finds somewhat attractive. What's he going to do? He's in a bind. The scene I'm thinking specifically of, though, is at a party. Uh, it's an outdoor scene, and there is Ron wearing a bathroom <laughs> outdoors. Go figure. That should tell you something right there about what he thinks about himself. 
He's standing, Veronica is sitting in a chair with a white suit on, and Ron comes up to her, and he's having trouble with this whole transition, and he says, well, you should know that I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> Veronica says, really? Yes, people know me, said Ron. Veronica replies, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> this is throwing Ron off, you can tell, because his next response is this. In my apartment, I have many leather-bound books, and it smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> That's like supposed to be the clinching comment. But anyway, Ron is having problems because he understands he's the man. Now, when I read this passage, I thought about Ron Burgundy. And I thought about hip, hype, and hoopla. Those are three words that maybe you saw somewhere. Hip, hype, and hoopla. You see, I think that back in the 70s, a lot of us lived on hip, hype, and hoopla. I would suggest to you that in the 80s, the 90s, the 10s, and the teens, we live on hip, hype, hoopla. I would suggest that even back in Paul's day, Peter's day, Simon's day, when this was written, people lived on hip, hype, and hoopla. You know what hip is, right? Hip is being captivated by the latest trends in fashion. That that is the end of all things. Say Gucci or something like that, and people melt. They see it and they gotta have it. That's, that's hip. Being at the cutting edge, getting people to notice you. And then there's hype. Hype is exaggerated and excessive claims about this or that or anything. And boy, don't we live in an age of exaggerated, excessive claims. And now that we have social media, you can get your exaggerated and excessive claims out there for an incredibly <coughs> wide audience to hear. You can put yourself into extreme because there is no face-to-face -face accountability. You can say what you want. And then there's hoopla. Hoopla is just kind of frenetic activity for frenetic activity's sake. It's kind of moving and being and doing and making a noise so that other people will pay attention to you. And sometimes, in one of the definitions of the word uh, hoopla, it says that it's a message that is out there intended to mislead. When I see that movie, Anchorman, and when I think about Simon the Magician, I think about hip and hype and hoopla. Because it is life lived at the edge, and not a good edge. It's life lived at the level of superficiality. You see, in this day and age, in Palestine, one of the challenges that the new faith movement followers of Jesus faced was there were traveling prophets and preachers going around and traveling magicians who tried to woo people into believing they were something great. They used things like incantations and figurines and amulets and spells and curses and blessings to try to show people that they could heal and make a difference and get rid of this and deal with that. And for many people, especially this newfound movement of following Jesus, the magicians were seen as people who were under the spell of the evil one in many ways. It became a problem. Simon had made a name for himself. And by the way, this isn't Simon Peter. This is a different Simon we're talking about. Simon had made a name for himself. He had drawn a crowd. He had a posse, if you will, an entourage. Simon was a big deal. People had paid attention to him. They had flocked him. And undoubtedly, not only did he empower the prestige guy because of what he did, he made a living from it as well. So he had a lot to lose when this Jesus movement comes into town. Here he is in Samaria, wowing people, when here comes the gospel preachers into the world. Now Samaria, as you might remember as times, over times that we talk about it, was a place that Jewish people didn't really want to go into. And the reason was because Samaritans were seen as less than real Jewish people. They worshipped in a different place, not Jerusalem. They had intermingled some of their practices with other religions. They had intermarried. They were seen by Jewish people 
of the day is not quite up to par. They were, in fact, held in very low regard. Jesus, bless him, had gone into Samaria, preaching and teaching and healing. He had opened up this area to God's movement. Now, when this story takes place, it is after a persecution had broken out in Jerusalem. And it's because of the persecution that Philip found himself in Samaria. You might remember, if you've heard this before, that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, I want you to hang out in Jerusalem, but you're going to have a power that's going to come on you. And when that power comes on you, then you're going to move out from here. You're going to get, go into all of Judea. You're going to go into Samaria, and you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And so what do you know? Here they are in Samaria. The, the plan of God through Christ is happening. The Spirit is moving people, but it happened because the church had been persecuted. So Philip is there in Samaria preaching the gospel. People are believing. Even some of Simon's people, the crowd that gathered to see Simon do his tricks, were hearing the gospel and they were believing. And don't you know it? And I don't think this is an insignificant thing. Even Simon was believing. But the question is this. How deep was his belief? How genuine was it? There's a telling comment that's made later in the passage that Eric read, and I just want to repeat it now because it helps us to back up and hear some of the earlier things that was said. Peter says this, May your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. You see, here's what I think happened. I think Simon heard the gospel and began to touch his heart. But his old superficial ways were so deeply ingrained in his life, his habits of living were so much a part of who he was, his fear of losing standing and prestige and power in people's eyes only allowed him to believe so much because when he saw Philip, doing what he was doing, aside from preaching the gospel. When he saw Philip bringing healing and he saw the works of the Holy Spirit, oh man, oh, did he want that. Oh, he wanted that. And when Peter and John come in to validate this ministry, this gospel ministry in the Samaria, to help these people who thought they were cut off from the God of Israel, to help them to understand that they too are part of God's people now through Jesus Christ, when they went in there and, and saw that display of laying on of hands and the Holy Spirit coming upon believers, Simon was like, oh man, i got to give you some of that. And in his world, the way you got it was you paid for it. You pulled out your wallet, you pulled out your card, and you bought it. You bought importance. You bought influence. You bought a name. You bought being somebody. And I believe that Luke, who we understand wrote this <coughs> book, the Acts of the Apostles, wrote it and included this story because he knew what was riding on the church not getting this right. You see, the church cannot survive if we allow it to decay from within. The church could not last. Friends, this was in the earliest days of the church. And they knew they were setting the tone for you and for me and for us together. And the tone is, if you allow people to think they can buy and sell God's power. If you allow people to believe on the level of superficiality, that the loudest voice, the slickest presentation, the nicest this and that is really what God's all about, you're going to allow the crumbling of the church from within. You see, the church is built on truth. It is built on substance. It is not built on superficiality. It's not built on branding. It's not built on the latest fad, the latest trend. It is built on the deeper things. 
You see, what Luke is trying to help us to understand, what Philip is preaching, what Peter and John are engaged in, is trying to help people to see the deeper things in the Spirit of God. What God can do, it can't be replicated by paying for it. It can't be about making a name for yourself. It's got to be about the power and Spirit of God at work built on the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. That is what the church is about. Maybe you've heard me say this before. If I take a $100 bill under every chair here, we'd have a crowd every week. <laughs> it's not about building a crowd. It's not about building our brand. It's not about having the slickest presentation. It's about you and me and us together going deeper and deeper and deeper into the things of substance, where God begins His work in the human heart, and where God begins to change lives and knit people together into a fellowship of faith, whereby the world says, wait, wow, what's happening? I see Jesus, and it's in those people, the body of Christ, moving through the community, making a difference, a change. I see it. My heart is warmed when I'm around that people. I want this because it's around Jesus. The church knew, we don't nip this now. If we allow people to think that they can buy this influence, we're dead. And we will never survive. Let me just pull out a couple points so that um, I feel better about it. We are tempted as a church and as individuals to do anything that we can to maintain our identity, our standing, and to keep an adoring crowd. That's not what the church is about. We are not called to be superficial, but substantive. And what is the story throughout the Acts of the Apostles, as we journey on, we <laughs> will hear this and see this time and again, what fuels ministry of the church is the Holy Spirit working through believers. It's not money. It's not ostentatious displays. And it's not superstar personalities. With all due respect to the people who stand up here and whom I genuinely love and you do too, it's not about having the best worship day or the most magnificent pipe organ. Or the killer website. All of the above are tools of ministry and praise of God, including money. <laughs> but the church is fueled by the Holy Spirit working through people. And so I, and in my role in this church, here is my part of my concern, part of my journey. I want us to go deep. I don't want us to live at the level of superficiality. I don't want us to live at the level of being slick and trying to make a name for ourselves and cutting corners because we want to draw a crowd. Because I believe that when the gospel is lived and shared, the crowds that are to be drawn are drawn. I challenge you personally, I challenge us as a church together to go deep. I challenge you not to be satisfied with reading a 30-second devotional every once in a while, or even every day. I challenge you to get beyond that. That's a good place to start. I challenge you not to stay there. I challenge you to be men and women and children of God's Word. I challenge you to be a man, woman, or child of prayer. I challenge you to get rid of the clutter in the world and in your life that is keeping you from doing those things. And I challenge you to give it a shot. Spending more time in God's Word, more time in prayer, more time in service, and see what happens. I challenge you to get over the hump when after you've done that for a few days, you say, this ain't working, there's no point in it. Get through it. You know how it is? 
When you do something, you're always challenged, something that's better for you, you're always challenged to stop it. And if you can get past that barrier, I can't say you're home free because there are always challenges. But if you allow yourself to keep at it, you're going to see significant changes in your life that you won't believe are happening. You're going to see the dynamics of your relationships change. The dynamics of families change. You're going to see this fellowship of faith change. You're going to see this community change. You're going to see the world change. You say, Tom, yeah, right. No, I'm telling you. Think about this. The man about whom and who is our foundation of faith died on a cross. And yet we're still talking about him. We're still praying about him. The powers of the day and the time thought this is squelched. We got it. It ain't no more. And guess what? We're here. No, wait. We're here. We're here. <coughs> the power of God's Spirit. Help. Let it set you free. And let it take you and take us beyond the hip and the height and the hook claw, beyond the superficial. Let's go deeper. And let's see what God's going to do. Pray with me, please. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you never give up on us, that you never give up on your church, you never give up on us as individuals. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. We don't want to get in the way of it. We don't want to quench it. Lord, we live bound up by so many things that get piled upon us that are not of you. And we want to be free. We want to start again. We want to do over. And you give us that through Jesus. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to trust you with our lives and in all things. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will be upon each of us. Will be indwelling our homes, our vehicles, our workplace, our play places. We pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit will come upon this fellowship of faith in a powerful way that you will transform us, that you will help the two lungs of this living being called Chardon Church to be healthy and strong and vibrant and full of you, that the world will know that Jesus saves, that he is alive, and that he will come again. Oh God, don't let us settle for the lesser things. Help us to go deep and wide with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.